every time I take a quiz, one of these online quizzes that you see get billed as being these well-structured belief designators, something that's supposed to reveal where you fall on a given topic or policy set or field of study. Um, whenever I take one of these, the results I get are pure garbage, just peak oversimplification of what I actually believe when you drill down on the beliefs. Um, hopefully you've taken a few of those at some point. What I'm doing here in this video probably won't make a lot of sense unless you've acquainted yourself with at least one of those. Uh, there's a good number of them floating around the net, like I said. And uh, the more of them you've taken, the more therapeutic value you stand to glean by taking part in what I'm doing here. Um, or maybe you weren't frustrated by any of them. Maybe you figured they were okay. In which case, hear me out anyway, because I have a lot of bad things to say about them. Um, I mean, it should be obvious, right? The options you get when you take one of those are, no matter which one you take, right? The options you get are needlessly reductive. You cannot expand on your answers. It's all about what your answer is and isn't. It's never about why you answer the way you do or how you arrived at that answer, the particular chain of reasoning you employed. It's never about that. Um, the test is just omissions all over the place, and yet it builds itself as being this great designator of what you believe. So maybe if you have beliefs that truly are that superficial, maybe it makes sense to you then. But I highly doubt anyone listening to this has beliefs that superficial. Um, and the one you're looking at here right now is prime example. I took this quiz back in January, and um, yeah, I dispute the ever living fuck out of the final score I received. Um, on his Twitter, Peter Singer actually directed people to this site. So when I saw it, I said, what the hell, give it a shot. Um, I, I guess he thinks a test like this is impressive enough and informative enough to be worthy of his stamp of approval. Um, all it does is just kind of makes me want to reconsider reading his books, which I've been meaning to read, because they're generally well-regarded books. But if he's going to endorse Q&A's this one-dimensional, yeah, no, no sale. Um, but it's not all bad because what these fake tests, is what I'm going to call them, what these fake tests have done is um, what they've motivated me to do is come up with something better, something a lot more comprehensive. And so here in this video, I'll be reading from installment one of a questionnaire I worked on and finally published as a blog post a couple of weeks ago. It's still something of a work in progress, but I am soliciting answers uh, from anyone watching this, as well as tips on how to improve the test itself. And as you will see, I did go out of my way to supplement many of the answers with fairly long-winded explanations for you know, pretty much to back up the answer. So the response options you're given are not just blanket agree versus disagree type selections. Um, they're also explanatory which is important. Many of the questions come in propositional form and not only do some of the answers consist of paragraph length reasoning, uh, the same can be said of the questions and propositions. They're fairly lengthy and they leave no doubt as to what is being asked or proposed. Um, I figured the more precise the question answer combo is, the higher the odds of the test's compass-like indexing actually pitting down where people stand. Uh, but despite that, I still didn't exhaust the types of answers that can be given to each of the 30 questions I posed here. Um, I gave detailed answers which I consider to be the fundamental ones, establishing the cruxes behind common disagreements. So if I overlooked what you might consider to be a crucial answer that should be a, one of the options, um, let me know and if I agree with it, I'll add it as option D or E or F. Um, it doesn't matter how far down the chain we go with the options. If it's a uniquely insightful answer, it should be listed as an option. And when you leave answers, feel free to include your confidence level as well. Anything from extremely confident to moderately confident to barely confident, uh, all the way down to unconfident. Um, right? It's, it's okay to give answers based on beliefs that were formed 
purely on a hunch. Not every belief we form is a belief we're ready to swear by. We're often encouraged to act as if that is the case, and that's another bug in the system. This is actually my main gripe with political compass quizzes. I could rant for hours about the imprecision of every single one I've taken. Um, people say that some are better than others, and maybe that's true, but it doesn't change the fact that they are all imprecise as hell. Um, and one of the main issues with them is that they don't inquire about the test taker's confidence level, ever, on any question. And that's not negligible, especially if the test is alleging to um, ascertain the test taker's extremist to moderate ratio and, and where you fall on that spectrum. Because it's not just the contents of the beliefs and the answers themselves that establish moderation or radicalism. The answers themselves are a factor, and perhaps the biggest factor, but they're by no means the only factor. I mean, suppose someone checks off a bunch of outlier answers, um, yeah, just when it comes to every question. But suppose then that that same person supplements each of those outlier answers with a um, barely confident epistemic status. If you're going to call someone like that an extremist, you're missing something. And it swings the other way too. You can have a so-called moderate result set insofar as you're measuring the what and not the how. Um, but the moment you do incorporate the how or the why, the same person's moderation can start to look very hollow. Um, if the person is being quizzed on a wide variety of topics, as is often the case with political compass tests, right? So if it's, if it's a wide-ranging test and that one person supplements every answer with extremely confident, um, like every last answer, extremely confident, top-notch confidence, I would not shy away from calling that type of person a type of radical, um, a cognitive radical. Right? Cho cho choosing a bunch of technically moderate answers doesn't undo the problem of unwarranted confidence. Now, if you say, well, who are you to assume that this person hasn't done their homework? Um, like with a simplistic test, a sort of elementary political compass quiz? Sure, maybe one individual has enough time to research the basics of all these different domains and have like a, a peak confidence level. But the moment you take a more in-depth test that covers tons of ground from non-overlapping disciplines, disciplines that are taught in like post-secondary, um, there's no way that one individual can, in good conscience, be supremely confident across the board with every question. And, and if they have convinced themselves that they are, that is a sort of radicalism in its own right. Um, so with, with all that said, I am, uh, as you can see by the graph here, I'm kicking things off with a questionnaire about economic ideologies. So yes, please do participate if you are intrigued and let me know how either the questions can be improved or how what I've included as answers can be improved or what I've omitted as an answer can be added. I am um, all ears yeah, eager to get the feedback. So, on with the show. Question 1. Should economic theories be judged by their ability to predict macro-level events or by the realism of their assumptions? A. Predictive measures. B. Realism measures. C. Both and or more. So, prime example of a question where if you think there needs to be an option D that gets at something that I omitted, let me know and I'll amend the quiz. Question 2. Does nudge theory offer ideal or sufficiently adequate remedies to the value action gap? A. Yes, nudge theory strikes the right balance between paternalistic laws mandating improvements to choice architecture and omitting the need for such improvements altogether. B. No, nudges designed to help some agents overcome irrational habits will unavoidably impose costs on others who are capable of being decisionally rational. Nudging people suggests a lack of respect for and a lack of confidence in human agency and individual responsibility. C. Not really. Nudges are suboptimal at best. If indirect techniques are to be encouraged, why not direct slash legal ones? Imagine if all parents and disciplinarians had only ever nudged their children and pupils into taking benevolent device slash orders. 
The analogy is imperfect, but it's approximate enough to lend support for going beyond indirect suggestions and for using direct measures to cultivate better judgment heuristics, at least in some circumstances. Question 3. Did behavioral economics make real contributions to economic knowledge? A. Yes, the behavioral school was a total game changer. Humans are predictably irrational in ways that defy economic orthodoxy. Take non-linear probability weighting which shows economic agents greatly overestimating costs and benefits of small probabilities and greatly underestimating costs and benefits of large probabilities. These things were entirely overlooked prior to the emergence of the behavioral school. B. No, neoclassical economics trumps behavioral economics. Generally speaking, economic agents are rational decision makers. The findings of the behavioral school are limited by experimentally observed human behavior, which has little to no bearing on market interactions. Educational opportunities and competition ensure at least a close approximation of rational behavior. C. Yes and no, some decent insights but ultimately overblown by fans of the behavioral school. The neoclassical models still have some use. Question 4. In the form of a proposition. Behavioral and experimental economists have shown that in the context of financial decision making, Ordinary people's decisions are routinely made under stress. Neoclassical schools ignore this at their peril. A. Agree. B. Disagree. C. Not the whole story slash other. Question 5. Proposition. America is a meritocracy. A. Agree. Equality under the law equals equality of opportunity equals American meritocracy. B. Disagree. Equality under the law is one variable for establishing equality of opportunity. Other variables exist and are apolitical. Examples of apolitical and interpersonal distortions of meritocracy include 1. Nepotism and cronyism 2. Hiring and promoting based on charm, looks, and brown-nosing criteria 3. Developmental advantages children of wealthy parents enjoy over children of lower and working class parents for more on 3, see behavioral geneticist Eric Turkheimer's work showing that the degree of heritability of numerous features varies depending on socioeconomic status. A developmental luck of the draw is not what people think of when picturing a genuine meritocracy. For a theoretical example of a principle fostering equality of opportunity, see luck egalitarianism, a position within distributive justice. C. Disagree. There is no equality under the law in a welfare state like America that uses a marginal tax code to extract resources from the makers and to hand them off to the takers. For a theoretical example of a truly meritocratic system, read Robert Nozick's Anarchy State and Utopia. No other setup takes the principle of self-ownership seriously. Question 6. Is class abolitionism necessary for establishing a true meritocracy? A. Yes. The existence of class guarantees class warfare. If history is any indication, this war is best fought with money propaganda, which puts the working slash non-owning classes at an immediate disadvantage. B. No. As long as economic upward mobility is possible, meritocracy is secured. Besides, class has always been a fuzzy concept. Chat up class abolitionists and you'll quickly discover that even they have a hard time non-arbitrarily distinguishing between owners and workers in many cases. The best curveball to throw at them are owners of small businesses. How small is too small? How big is too big? They can't tell you because they themselves haven't figured it out. C. No. Orthodox class analysis misses the mark. This, however, doesn't make B's answer entirely accurate. Given the exhaustive number of unlikely outcomes that are merely possible, stressing the technical possibility of economic upward mobility is unhelpful. Going beyond the claptraps entails shunning the idea of class and possibility as signifiers of anything. Rather, we can say that meritocracy and justice are closely related, and that all disparities that arise from responsible choices are legitimate on grounds of justice. On the other hand, it falls from the same commitment to justice that all disparities that arise from unchosen factors, for example, brute bad luck, are illegitimate and meritocratically objectionable. Combining this affirmative view of individual responsibility with a critical approach to the arbitrariness of brute luck 
is bound to foster competitiveness and fairness like no generically principled system can. Question 7, in the form of a proposition. Debates surrounding distributive justice have implications for, but are ultimately distinct from, descriptive analysis of functional and dysfunctional economic systems, that is, modes of production. A. Agree. There is no contradiction in simultaneously supporting Rawlsianism, which is a distributive theory, and some form of capitalism, which is an economic theory. Nor is socialism necessarily wedded to any distributive slash redistributive principle. B. Disagree. Economics and distributive justice are interlocked. An unjust distributive theory is economically dysfunctional on arrival. If you side with Rawls over Nozick, your support for capitalism is cognitive dissonance. Question 8. Proposition. A system that generates more injustice for most with a higher standard of living for all is inferior to a system that generates more justice for most with a lower standard of living for all. Note, injustice in this context can be institutional atop governmental. Living standards that play can be cashed out by all the relevant metrics welfare economists rely on to measure quality of life. A. Yes, it would be inferior. So long as the trade-off isn't entirely one-sided, our concern for justice proper ought to override rigidly qualitative concerns. B. No, it wouldn't be inferior. Ask the global poor if they would prefer to obtain a much higher standard of living and not see their children starve, but have to put up with much more structural malfeasance as a result. It's no mystery what they'll choose. Or simply ask Westerners who have been stigmatized to one degree or another by their discriminatory governments, institutions, or fellow citizens if they would like to swap places with the global poor so as to escape the oppressive grips facing them on the domestic front. Their answers will speak louder than your abstractions. C. Neither inferior nor superior. The proposition wrongly assumes that increases slash decreases of incomparable evaluative criteria can be weighted against one another. Question 9. Proposition. Some countries are very poor and some countries are very rich because of global capitalism. A. Yes. The adage, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer, has never ranked truer. B. No, this is lunacy. The pie has gotten considerably bigger. If it hadn't, we would never have gotten past the Stone Age. The countries lagging behind are in the spots they are in due to any of the following internal problems they face. Governmental corruption, dearth of natural resources, bad trade deals, leaders engaging in uncooperative power plays with potential allies, unmotivated workforce, poorly skilled workforce, intellectually disengaged and incurious populace, etc. C. Yes and no. The truth is somewhere in the middle, given the history of colonialism and imperialism stifling the third world's chances. Question 10, in the form of a proposition. People who self-identify as anti-capitalist should prefer a future of revolutionary maximalists over a future of moderate people like Peter Singer, who care deeply about the poor, but who tolerate and will continue to tolerate the existence of private capital? Answer A. Yes, naturally. Peter Singer is not an anti-capitalist and sometimes engages in apologia of capitalism. Given his enthusiasm for effective giving, Singer is on the other side and maximalists are on the side that grasps the source of the problem, that being capitalism. Seasoned revolutionaries will have no issues with this because to be a revolutionary is to co-sign on short-term pain for long-term gain. B. No. Civil anti-capitalists should take Singer instead. Opposition to capitalism should not be a signature issue for identifying ideological foes and allies. There's much more to consider. And history is chock full of emancipatory cures which, when implemented, ended up being worse than the disease. Question 11. Proposition. The existence of global capitalism explains why most workers are left with no options for employment in egalitarian, non-hierarchical, democratically run cooperatives. A. Yes. Capitalism by its nature eliminates the possibility of widespread worker-controlled or worker-owned businesses. The capitalist class being the only class with major political clout, it's also the only class that stands to gain nothing by tolerating the existence of such businesses. Tells you all you need to know. B. No. Workers who believe in cooperatives and who are not employed by a cooperative 
are in the position they are in because socialists notoriously suffer from coordination problems. Moreover, in many regions there are simply too few workers who believe in cooperatives. A worker who remains apathetic or ambivalent or deeply cynical about the supposed benefits of working in a cooperative where no one is in charge is not, quote, on your side simply because he's a fellow worker, just as an owner or a landlord who does believe in the value of cooperatives but who, quote, has to do what he has to do for the time being, is not on the other side of socialists on this issue. Status does not and should not predict for belief. Question 12. For anti-capitalists only. Would you rather live in a capitalist system and society containing people who are generally altruistic, responsible, knowledgeable, decent, wise, and who believe in capitalism, or under a socialist system and society containing people who are generally inept, careless, oafish, self-serving, and who lack a passionate belief in socialism. A. I'd choose the socialist one. As militant radicals, we understand that the systemic issues enshrined in capitalism are enough to outdo any concerns you could raise about the general quality of the populace within said system. Such concerns will always be secondary for they fail to grapple with the structural roots of what likely gave rise to them. B. I'd choose the capitalist one. Clearly a flawed system with impressive constituents makes for a better society than the converse. If the day ever comes where my opposition to capitalism turns so fervid that it blinds me to the simple fact, I hope that someone is around to give me a good smack on the head and to explain to me how my anti-capitalism has become another axe-to-grind type fetishism. Question 12 transposed, for anti-socialists only. Would you rather live in a socialist system and society containing people who are generally altruistic, responsible, knowledgeable, decent, wise, and who believe in socialism, or under a capitalist system and society containing people who are generally inept, careless, oafish, self-serving, and who lack a passionate belief in capitalism? A. I'd choose the capitalist one. Econ 101 shows that the planning-related issues embedded in socialism or communism are enough to outdo any concerns one could raise about the general quality of the populace within said system. Such concerns are, at most, secondary, for they fail to analyze the economic roots of the problem. B. I'd choose the socialist one. A flawed economic system with impressive constituents makes for a better society than the inverse. If the day ever comes where my hostility to socialism blinds me to this truism, I will have turned my devotion to capitalism into another fetishism. Question 13. Assume the labor theory of value is correct. Would you rather be an exploited worker, that is, a non-owner, with a steady income in a Western country circa 2018, or an unexploited worker with a steady income in a non-capitalist country that's agrarian, densely populated, and in no way tech-savvy, making your daily grind more difficult overall. In both cases, you would be working a standard 40-hour work week. A. No, I would rather have my labor be unexploited, period. A woke worker is a worker who strives to remove any parasites extracting a significant chunk of his physical or mental labor. B. Yes, I would rather have my labor be exploited on paper, but have an objectively easier workload day to day, along with an objectively easier and safer life once I clocked out. Question 14, in the form of a proposition. Descriptively speaking, even if most workers understood and agreed with the labor theory of value, or with any other socialism is greater than capitalism frame, it is not a stretch to forecast that they would still prefer to exist in and work under capitalistic modes of production with the benefits of modernity compared to what's on offer in non-feudal and non-aristocratic societies which are pre-industrial and pre-capitalistic. A. Yes, this is how most people view their work life. It's more about the totality of labor-based difficulty than it is about analytical abstractions like exploitation. The ordinary people anti-capitalists claim to represent are not invested in a triumphalistic, quasi-romantic ideology where labor must vanquish capital when all is said and done. That's the fetishists. B. No. Workers care deeply about being exploited. Questions about the totality of labor-based difficulty are secondary. 
The workers who prioritize things in some other way suffer from false consciousness. Even if they can recite anti-capitalist literature better than actual anti-capitalists can. Question 15. Proposition. Optimally informed workers would benefit, whether they admit it or not, from having a democratic and egalitarian workplace to work in. Once an individual worker is freed of capitalist propaganda, the individual would consider the co-op an improvement even if the majority of his co-workers go on to vote for things he ends up disapproving of or distribute tasks in ways that leave him feeling like more of a pushover as compared to how the employer or manager had done previously. A. False. Whatever discontent may exist, hierarchies are not the source of it. We should care about good versus bad decisions at the workplace, not necessarily about how many individual workers contribute to the making of said decisions. Some workers really are numbskulls who have no business anywhere near a managerial or decisional task. Others would be okay at it, but don't really care for it. Recall how in American Beauty, Lester quit his corporate gig to flip burgers because, quote, I want whatever gives me the least possible amount of responsibility. That type exists, and if you've ever been inside a boardroom, you'll know there's no sense in trying to talk them out of it. B. True. The inegalitarian setup is more of a problem than how a worker personally relates to his colleagues, or whether one feels like subordinating oneself to the co-op's consensus. Whether consciously or subconsciously, most workers dislike having to work for a boss in undemocratic workplaces. Question 16. In order to be ideologically consistent, must we choose between slogans like greed is good and money is the root of all or most evil? A. Yes, we do. And I choose greed is good because this is in keeping with what type of organism human beings are. If your ideology goes against human nature, you will fail. If greed per se is bad, you shouldn't be reading this. You should be penniless most of the time, fixatedly enslaving yourself to the unmet basic needs of every last person who's badly off. Good luck with that. B. No, both sayings are mistaken and retarded. Greed is to be overcome, whereas those who attribute negative motives to the pull money has on people typically know nothing about modern monetary theory and don't care to read up on it. Thinking that something as purely instrumental as money is the root of all or most evil is like thinking that barter is the root of all or most evil. Money just increases the efficiency of bartering. Modern day bartering. C. Yes we do, and I choose the repudiation of money. MMT is economic sophistry just as every other currency scheme has been. Only the Venus Project can save the world. Question 17. Proposition. A ceiling on rents lowers the quality and quantity of available housing to the point where the overall drawbacks of rent control outweigh its overall benefits. A. Agree. It's been tried many times and the results are nothing to write home about. B. Disagree. It hasn't been tried in quite the right ways as of yet, or if it has, the stats we're seeing are cherry-picked and slanted. Question 18. Proposition. Generally speaking, affluent countries should not prohibit or disincentivize, for example, nudge, big businesses and other employers from outsourcing work to foreign-slash-developing countries. A. E agree. Listen to the expertise of the elites. B. Disagree. Listen to the fury of the populists. C. Agree in principle, but the experts are wrong too. The impact of outsourcing on the workforces in affluent nations should have been softly incremental from day one, if for no other reason than political expediency. Question 19. Assume that the free movement of capital had not been so maddeningly fast-paced. Would that alone have been enough to prevent the resurgence of hardline nationalism across America and much of Europe? Or is something else going on here? Uh, no, the same backlash would have kicked in because global free trade is as economically misguided as the free movement of peoples is. With slower pacing, the resurgence would have taken longer, but Gen Z would still be seeing it in their lifetime. B. Yes, with cleverer pacing, things would have remained stable and the elites would have still been entrusted across the affluent continents. C. No. 
people still don't get it. This is not about economic anxiety. It never was. See the rundown of recorded economic crises and how rarely they are followed by drastic shifts in economic belief or any other topic that intersects with economic belief. The revival of nationalism is mostly about demographic change. Deal with it. Question 20. Proposition. By far, the primary driver of inflation is too much growth in the money supply. A. Agree. 83% of economists seem to agree as well. B. Disagree. The absolute quantity of currency does matter, but not any more than consumer confidence matters, which drives the transactional velocity of money. Question 21. Proposition. Professional sports franchises, fireworks, and other entertainment spectacles should never receive subsidies from any public treasury. A. Agree. If you enjoy it, fund it yourself. B. Disagree. If an absolute majority of voters poll well on it or are willing to vote for it, let it happen. Question 22. Proposition. No economic system is capable of playing up to everyone's strengths and filtering out everyone's weaknesses. All variants of socialism are bound to reduce the option set of certain types of people. For example, solitary types who have an entrepreneurial instinct and who don't excel at teamwork. All variants of capitalism are bound to reduce the option set of individuals who, despite being hardworking and excelling at teamwork, lack an entrepreneurial spirit and dislike taking orders from bosses. Thus, it is a mistake to frame the capitalism versus socialism debate along moral or axiological lines. A. Agree. In a country of millions, widespread constraint is unavoidable. No system is inherently authoritarian or anti-authoritarian. B. Disagree. One is inherently authoritarian and the other is inherently anti-authoritarian. There are workarounds to the constraint problem, like encouraging psychographic conformity across the entirety of the employable population. This actually, I can probably do an entire, I can probably write a book on this proposition. And I just might at some point, because spoiler, A is the right answer. <laughs> I don't often give spoilers, I'm probably going to give spoilers in, a, in comments and elsewhere, but for this one, I simply have to spoil it. It's so glaringly obvious that A is the right answer. And yet, so many people are cocksure that B is the right answer, and that one of those two is inherently authoritarian and the other is inherently liberating. Um, so yeah, I'll, more on that down the road. But yeah, this is I should have probably put this proposition near the top, because most people probably tuned out at this point. But I love me this proposition, and um, it's pr one of the most under-discussed things, and I'm going to bring it to the forefront as much as I can. Moving on. Question 23. Proposition. True socialism calls for economic planning. To socialize is to centralize. A. Agree. Socialists who try to wiggle around this gradually introduce more and more elements of capitalism into their models, to the point where they just end up with a mixed economy. This is why so many people who self-identify as democratic socialist don't even believe in overthrowing capitalism. B. Disagree. C. Market socialism, which is not a mixed economy, despite relying on market forces for its allocation of capital goods and products. There's no ideological tension or compromise with having a market economy within the framework of a social ownership of the means of production. Another drastically overlooked thing. Um, more on that later as well. Question 24. Proposition. There is no true socialism. There is just what people mean when they use the word socialism. If North Americans use it as shorthand for central planning, that's what socialism means in North America. If the rest of the world uses it in its more doctrinaire sense, that's what socialism means across the rest of the world. A. Disagree. You can't be a little bit pregnant just as you can't have a little bit of socialism. It's an all-or-nothing deal. Not so with the fluidity of public sectors, stimulus packages, redistribution, and central planning. B. Agree, but this has wide-reaching ramification that no one likes to be reminded of. If colloquial misapplications of technical isms are green-lit, such that an ism's history and origins can be ignored at the drop of a hat, 
it's time to stop complaining about North Korea billing itself as the Democratic People's Republic of North Korea. Question 25. Proposition. People who say that Marxist and other critiques of capitalism clamor for equality of outcome demonstrate that they know nothing about Marx, let alone the more obscure critics of exploitation. A. Agree. A mode of production mandating that income only be earned through intellectual and manual labor, where wealth cannot be acquired through capital gains or birthright, doesn't imply a path to equality. Marx did not believe that all workers would enjoy equal earning potential post-capitalism. And if post-capitalism did bring about the elimination of earning gaps between groups and individuals, the resultant parities would be pure happenstance. B. Disagree. Latter-day supporters of Marx have built upon the original works, prompting iterations and branching off into sects. Fair play to those who go back and analyze the initial works, but when it comes to the refined doctrines of contemporaries who self-identify as Marxian economist, classical Marxists insisting that Marx's own work is the only relevant barometer for discourse is slippery. This is especially true as it relates to those who agitate for intergroup equality of outcome. Don't tell me these people don't exist, and don't pretend that they're uninfluenced by the Marxist tradition. Question 26. Proposition. There is nothing economically freeing about imposing capitalism on a socialistic nation whose citizenry overwhelmingly rejects capitalism in favor of socialism. Correspondingly, there is nothing economically freeing about imposing socialism on a capitalistic nation whose citizenry overwhelmingly rejects socialism in favor of capitalism. A. Agree. Economic freedom is effective rather than formal. It cannot be decoupled from economic belief. B. Disagree. Economic freedom, like all freedom, has nothing to do with whatever kooky thing you personally believe makes you free. You are objectively free when you exist in an economic system governed by the tenets of ideology X. All other systems make you objectively unfree. Question 27. Proposition. It is a myth that capitalism requires perpetual growth to sustain itself. A. Agree. If capitalism exists the moment someone is legally permitted to enrich themselves through resource ownership, all the hoopla about infinite growth isn't integral to the blueprint. B. Disagree. You cannot encourage ever-increasing profitability across all or most industry without fostering a system of endless growth. Question 28. Proposition. Cultural and attitudinal factors play the biggest role in determining whether or not cash payments increase the well-being of entitlement recipients to a higher degree than transfers in kind of equal monetary values tend to do. As such, economists should stop recommending a one-size-fits-all policy in favor of one or the other and adjust for regional variants. A. Agree. B. Disagree. Huh, I might add something to those agree and disagree answers a bit later. I guess I blanked on doing it before. Um, but maybe sometimes it's good to just not expand on the answer. Maybe uh, people are going to get exhausted <laughs> given how many answers have an expansion to them. Uh, question 29, proposition. You only see non-economists saying things like, quote, learn basic economics in the middle of an argument because actual economists know better. A. Agree. Such an arguer takes the particular school of economics he's familiar with and impressed with and bamboozles himself into an undue conviction where its assumptions are the only credible ones. So it's no surprise that he assumes ignorance on the part of anyone who doesn't parrot the basics of what that one school teaches. B. Disagree. It's perfectly legitimate in the context of Econ 101, just as it makes perfect sense to say, quote, learn basic physics to people who are clueless on physics. Economic pluralism is economic ignorance. Question 30. What's the difference between private property and personal property slash possessions? A. Nothing. It's just more sophistry that grabby socialists and communists came up with to justify abolishing private property. B. Simple. One is limited to personal use. That is, when a possession is acquired in a socially just way, the possessor can exclude anyone from using it. Private property, on the other hand, is not relational in this subject-object sense.
but rather in an interpersonally implicative sense, blurring the line between self-ownership and resource ownership. Thus, the open season on natural commons in the way of artifacts, factories, mines, dams, infrastructure, natural vegetation, mountains, deserts, seas, etc. So, that about does it for this installment. It's installment number one, and I think you can get a gist of what I'm trying to do here. Many of these are... Um, I mean, I put it better than people who would normally put it, as in the expansion to the answers. I put it much better. I steel man every single adjustment to the answer, add on to the answer. But the thing is, you never see the, adv the debates advance from there. And that's what I'm hoping to do with this. Not just to get a, an idea of, a rough idea of where people fall, but actually to take these initial stages of these debates and get past them so that we can actually start arguing from somewhere closer to the XYZs as opposed to the ABCs, right? Because everything in terms of the opening statements is built into the test. So you can choose your opening statement, take into account the expansion of the answer, and then argue from there on out so that the debates are hopefully not as formulaic as they always seem to be when I glance at not only comment sections, but even a lot of what um, economist A versus economist B <laughs> type debates. Uh, and again, economists from different schools in economics as well. It's, it only goes so far, these um, spoken exchange debates. It's pretty dismal. So I'm hoping this does something to get the ground moving on changing that. Um, and just prime example with question 30, with this, what is the difference between private property and, and personal property? So a lot of people will, for instance, if they believe there is a difference, then they will believe in abolishing private property. And if they believe there is no difference, it's more or less the same thing, they will believe in preserving private property. How many people can you think of who both understand and are willing to accept that there's a difference for good reasons, but at the same time still not believe in abolishing private property? And right? so I count myself as someone who understands, yeah, there's clearly a difference between private property and personal property, but at no point am I agitating to abolish private property. I think it would come with more um, um, harms than benefits at this stage, and probably in most stages in human history. So I hate to sound like a stickler for shades of gray and things are not black and white, because there's a lot of people who say that, but they only pay lip service to it. They don't really mean it. It's a bit of a yeah, it's, it's a bit of a cliche at this point to appeal to the existence of shades of gray. Um, but despite the fact that a lot of people don't truly mean it when they appeal to it, um, it definitely is one of these things that is sorely lacking, and I'm not going to shy away from pushing for it, just because it's, it's a bit of a um, stereotypical thing to do these days. Um, so, with that said, this... Uh, this is installment one, and uh, let's see what we can do for the next one. Let me know your answers in the comment section.